Hello, and thank you for joining me in this, our third ser lesson in our series on Thanksgiving. As we consider this time of year, and it, it tends to be a time when we, as, a, as God's people, reflect on the things that we're thankful for. And so far, just as by way of reminder in this series, uh, we've, we're, we've considered um, Thanksgiving and sacrifice. That as the people of God today, we can sacrifice to God by giving Him praise with the, with the fruit of our lips. We can go to prayer and, and give prayers of thanksgiving to God that would be uh, to Him considered a sacrifice with a pleasing aroma. Um, last time in our last video, we saw thanksgiving and answered prayer of, of developing the habit and the practice of considering our prayers and the ways in which God answers our prayers and sometimes how powerfully he answers them, how wonderfully, how beautiful they unfold. Um, and, it, and it should cause us to want to give him thanks for the ways in which he, he answers our prayers. Today, I want to talk about something that might seem a little different. Um, maybe one that we haven't really thought about that much, and that is Thanksgiving for the church. And I got this idea from, uh, again, the, uh, the letter of Paul to the Philippians. And so Philippians, uh, would you read with me Philippians 1, uh, beginning at verse 1, and we'll read through verse 11. Verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may overflow still more, and more in real knowledge and in all discernment, so that you may discover the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Are you ready for the message God has for us today? Cool, let's dig in. I wonder if there are times, brethren, I wonder if there are times Christians get so lost in the division and problems of the church that they forget to be thankful for one another. Thankful to God for the church, for their local church, for the, the church, capital C, that includes all the various bodies of Christ. We read this passage, and even with their problems, Paul is thankful for the Philippian church. There's always going to be problems. The church is made up of people. And it's, the, it's our, in our nature. There's always going to be problems. Divisions may happen. And maybe, like me, you've been unfortunate in seeing what happens when a church divides. But does that mean that we should not be thankful for the church? In a world that struggles with reality and truth and love, here in the church is to be a place where Love and fellowship are central. And Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. And Paul teaches us thanksgiving for the church in this letter. What is then the source of Paul's thanksgiving? What is it about this church that makes Paul 
so thankful to God that it brings him joy. Well, Paul begins verse 3 with, I thank God. The word th- with the word thanks, Paul is saying the continuous reality for him is thanksgiving for Philippi. This is a reality. This is not some made-up thought on his ha- behalf. This is the reality. This is the reality of the feelings he has for this church. This word means to express gratitude, to show appreciation. And with this word, there are two other words connected with it. The first is offer. And we find that word in uh, verse 4, always offering. That word offering, the action of offering prayer with joy is simultaneous with the action of thanks. They happen at the same time, which I guess we would expect because it's, it's what's going on when he's praying. The second word is confident, and this one's interesting. He says in another verse, verse 6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. So that word confident. The action of this word is actually before the action of thanks. His confidence, then, what this is saying is his confidence leads into his thanks and his offering of prayer for them. I just think that's wonderful. The confidence of Paul has has already come before he goes into prayer. And it serves as part of his motivation to pray for them. His confidence that God is working among them. He's confident because God is working in and through them. And uh, it is a good work, Paul says, that God is doing. And he's confident that God will complete it among them. And this leads into his prayer. So we see then the, the motivation for Paul's thanksgiving for this church this and we see this so we see here the motivation for Paul's thanksgiving for this church and this is seen all throughout the letter he opens the letter and re, and and kind of repeats it it's an idea that's repeated throughout the letter and in our passage Paul lists the reasons for why he is so thankful why is he so confident well first of all they're in his heart that he carries them constantly in his heart. Whether he was a prisoner or defending the gospel, they shared with Paul. Their words of love and appreciation to Paul were backed up by the actions of, of sharing with Paul. And lastly, he deeply longs for them. He longs for them. Uh, with the love of Christ, with the affection of Christ Jesus. So it says, that's the source of his thanksgiving. So let's break down Paul's prayer of thanksgiving then. The whole letter to the Philippians is really a prayer of thanksgiving and joy for this church. Perhaps that is one reason why for the past couple of months we keep coming back to the letter of Paul to the Philippians. And in our passage this today, it is a prayer Paul offers in thanksgiving and joy. Included is the request that their love overflows still more. That they're not done with their love. That their love continues to overflow. And that the overflow then also with in more in real knowledge and discernment. To take the letters and the things that they're hearing about and know about Christ and 
and develop a deeper knowledge, more knowledge, more real knowledge and discernment. He prays that they will discover the things that are excellent. He prays that they be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ and that they be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ. What a wonderful prayer of thanksgiving for this church. And this is a prayer that he offers to God. You see, in Christian life, the most obvious evidence of God's grace is thanksgiving and joy. The more we become aware of the grace of God in our life, the more thanksgiving and joy we have. Thanksgiving and joy are tied together and the motivation behind and are the motivation behind Paul's letter to the Philippian church. In fact, they are the motivation for Paul's prayer and letter. He's writing this letter because he's thankful and full of joy for this church. There are certain matters then that take up most of the letter. His genuine thank, thanksgiving for the Philippians and their partnering, partnering with him in the gospel over many years. Uh, news about his present condition, he supplies that as he knows they're praying for him and support him. And then there's an appeal to their steadfastness in, in unity. He says in his prayer, their continued uh, growth, their continue, that they continue to be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ. These matters are clear in Paul's thanksgiving and prayer. And about the thanksgiving and prayer of Paul, Gordon Fee says, Thanksgiving and prayer filled with joy on behalf of all of God's people in Philippi. It's not just one or two people. It's the whole church. It's the whole church, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This isn't a perfect church. They had problems. They faced problems. But Paul loved them. Paul offered a prayer of thanksgiving for them, and they're a source of joy in his life. What we learn in this passage is that for Paul, prayer and thanksgiving beautifully, wonderfully combined. Thanksgiving for, for them takes place in the context of Paul's habit for praying for them. And so I encourage all of us to go through this passage and, and read. The words that Paul uses in this prayer of thanksgiving for the church. What is then the application for us? So this is all great and dandy. It's a letter filled with thanksgiving and joy. 1 through 11 is a prayer of thanksgiving and joy for the church. We're talking about thanksgiving for the church. How does this apply to amazing grace? How does this apply to me as the pastor of Amazing Grace. You see, a source of Paul's thanksgiving and joy was remembering the church of Philippi in his prayers. There are churches I think about. Amazing Grace is one of them. But there are churches I think about. And when I think about those, those churches, some of the members that I love so dearly are gone. And some of these members knew me as a kid. How do I know they knew me as a kid? When I'd walk into a church, if somebody called me Tommy, I had no idea who they were, but I knew the fact that they called me Tommy, they knew who I was. And sure enough, I would find out that they were friends of my parents or they knew my grandparents. On both sides, both my grandparents at, at, at times went to church. And I just fondly remember them. It, it, it brings joy to remember them. Amazing Grace, when I think of you, when I think of the ways that you support me in our work, the ways that you, you come alongside, many of you tell me every Sunday, well, I pray for you. 
I can feel it. And I, I understand what Paul means by thanksgiving for the church and that being a source of joy. And so when I pray for, for these other churches and for you, Amazing Grace, I'm filled with thanksgiving and joy. You see, here's a chance. We're really being given a chance in this season and in this lesson. A chance for us to reflect as a church. When we pray for each other, does it come from thanksgiving and joy? Or is it because of a sense of duty or compulsion? Kind of, well, that's just something we do. Can I challenge you? Challenge myself to, before we pray for someone in our church, think about the church and let the prayer come from a place of thanksgiving and joy. Now, that doesn't mean in our love that we aren't hurt when they're hurt. We don't cry when they cry. But it demonstrates to us how much we love them. And I think that'll add to the prayer. We learn in Paul's letter that he had the habit or practice of praying. And in this habit, with regard to Philippi, it served as a source of his thanksgiving and joy. Is it true for us? Is it true for you? Paul recognized their koinonia. There's that word again. We talked about it a couple months ago. It's In verse 5, it's that word participation. See, remember when we saw it earlier, we talked a couple months ago, we saw it in the word fellowship, and we saw that it's more than just fellowship. I grew, you know, I under... For a long time, I understood koinonia to be joint participation. And there is a, a, a part of that. It is also fellowship. But it's much more than that. It means communion or the privileges of an intimate association or group. I think sometimes we use fellowship and joint participation just flippantly. When the word is talking about this like intimate fellowship, a bond that we carry amongst each other or have among each other. And so here again is this word that is more than just fellowship or joint participation. It includes our intimate relationship with one another. How about us as we reflect? Do we recognize that about us? Do we recognize that we have koinonia in the work of the kingdom? We don't labor alone. We don't do the work alone. For Paul, he understood that. They had koinonia together, Paul and Philippi. And for Paul, because they, they participated, they were intimate in association with Paul, when he prayed, it was a source of thanksgiving and joy. Do you recognize that our labors in the gospel, in the work of the kingdom, is a, particip a partnership and a fellowship and a communion? A koinonia together? You know, please listen. And I mean this sincerely, and, and, and I pray that it's taken without harm. With all that is happening in society, where reality and truth are either considered relative or just simply ignored, where it's more difficult for Christians who oppose society to oppose society, we need to pray. And in our prayers, it needs to come from a sense of thanksgiving and joy. That needs, they must be the source. In our prayers, we should, we should include 
that for one another. Just as Paul did. If we truly recognize our koinonia in the kingdom as a church, then thanksgiving and joy exist. How do I know that? Because of this letter. Because of what Paul says in the first 11 verses. That is true of any pastor and church where koinonia truly exists, then in the prayers and in their meetings, there is a source of thanksgiving and joy for one another. So reflect. Do I have thanksgiving and joy in my heart for the church? Do you have thanksgiving for the church? Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for these lessons on Thanksgiving. And Father, as Thanksgiving Day approaches this week, and there is a sense of Thanksgiving and joy as we assemble with our families, I pray, Heavenly Father, that that would also be true for our spiritual family here at Amazing Grace. That every week we look forward to our time together and the motivation comes from a sense of thanksgiving and joy. So thank you, Lord, for the example of Paul to the Philippians, for the prayer that he offered to this church. And may, it be a, may we may have that example go deep in our hearts, that we too will share thanksgiving and joy among one another as we pray for each other. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me in, the, in uh, today's lesson. Uh, next, uh, next time will be our last lesson in this series as we look at Thanksgiving in song. I look forward to our time together next time. Have an amazing week, and may God bless you.